Hi everyone, I'm Shauna, Wellness A to Z, and I'm here with Kate Donovan, who is an amazing burnout expert. Um, she's an acupuncturist and a burnout expert. What the hell does that even mean? We're gonna get to the bottom of that, and she's gonna have some amazing guidance for us um, in this COVID-19 quarantine time for you know how, how to minimize burnout and how to you know recognize the signs. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's so good to finally actually like talk face to face. I know that we trade a lot of voice messages and comments on Instagram, but it's actually good to, to connect. So without further ado, Kate, how did you get into TCM? And then also, how did that lead into the burnout? This is, um, I'm going to do the quickest version of this story possible. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I always, I told my grandmother when I was three, I was going to be a doctor. And that was my plan. I graduated 12 out of 600 kids in my high school class. I got almost a full scholarship to Boston University. I was on a pre-med track. I was, you know, science, whatever. But for whatever reason, my minor in college was Eastern religion. Interesting. I always, right, I always had a fascination and I thought I have to have a minor. It has to be something outside of the sciences because I had most of the sciences even for my first year done before I went to school because of AP classes. Oh, right? So I, I didn't pass any of those AP, I took the AP <laughs> test and failed and I have a degree in history. I did not pass that, but okay. Respect. Yeah, I did. I had AP bio, AP chem and, uh, AP bio, AP chem, AP something else. I don't remember. So I started into this program and I, first of all, hated it. Second of all, could, I hate admitting this. It's so embarrassing to me, but I could not pass organic chemistry. Oh, not embarrassing. I failed chemistry in high school and had to go take physical science just to graduate. So not embarrassing. That's like totally fine. Chemistry was not a problem. Organic chemistry. The our, my teacher's aide was from China, did not speak a lot of English. And on top of that, I just sat in the class, even when the professor was there and just had no idea what he was saying for the first time in my life. I was always the smart kid. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and I was just like, what? And I thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And then I took a course called the sociology of medical school. And we had to read a book for that course. And it was somebody's story of going through med school and the toll that it took on them and all of that. And I read through it and I was like, I can't do this to myself. Like wow. I'm going to end up graduating from med school. I'm likely going to have to borrow about a quarter of a million dollars to go because my parents don't have anything. Like when I, when I started school, Boston University was $36,000 a year. My parents combined didn't make that much money that year. So there's no chance I'm getting any assistance right. from that because they just don't have it available. So I'm going to go to school, be a quarter of a million dollars in debt, work 80 to 100 hours a week, practically kill myself. Then by the time I have to pay back the debt, I'm going to have to pay the insane insurance rates to be a doctor. And I'll be like 35 by the time I can even like treat a patient. Like what the, and I was horrified because this was my entire life plan up in smokes. And because I was doing the minor in Eastern religion, there was a course that was offered for the first time. And it was a course on meditation. It was technically a course for a master's degree. It was a master's level course, but because it was brand new, People were allowed to take it that were not at the master's level. And I ended up getting into that class. And the teacher was the world's foremost scholar on Taoism and the person who taught intro to Chinese medicine in the pre-med program at Boston University. All comes together. I love it that. All, that. Right? It all comes together. So I went into our office hours one day and I said, Livia, I don't know what to do. Like I'm, I'm halfway through this class of sociology of medical school. I'm horrified. I already dropped out of organic chemistry because I, I couldn't do it. I don't, I've always planned on being a doctor. I don't know what to do. She said, well, just do Chinese medicine. And I said, what the F is Chinese medicine? That was my response. It was my very Boston. It's usually people's response. What the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what the F? I don't know what Chinese medicine means. And, but I started doing research and I realized a couple of things. One, the Eastern way of viewing the world was more natural to me than anything that I had felt to that point. It, the fact that there's always a way to make sense of things. 
I don't, I can't always get there. Even I've, I've been studying Chinese medicine since I was 18. I'm, I'll be 38 this year. So it's been 20 years. And even though I can't always get to the right explanation because Chinese medicine is a lifelong study, there is always a connection and an explanation. There's no such thing as it just appeared because it just appeared. That does not exist in Chinese medicine. And that made me feel safe that there's always a way to explain it because their thinking is uh, circular and not, and not linear. So I, I think that that's fascinating. And I also realized because I had always, always planned on being an MD, it was important to me to prove my worthiness with a degree. And Chinese medicine is a master's degree at least. Mm -hmm. So I thought at least I won't have an MD, I won't go to medical school, but I will have a master's degree. And that was really important to me, especially at the time. It's less important as time passes, but that's easy to say because I already have it. So I can already claim that. And that, that was really important to me at the time. It, it totally makes sense to me. I mean, as somebody who has, you know, I, I have a very similar story in that I wanted to go to law school from the time I was five years old. I took the LSAT, didn't do very well, but still, you know, started to pursue the application process and had a very similar kind of like aha moment where I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go into this type of debt. I'm going to be miserable. Like, I think I'd be a decent lawyer, but there's got to be something else. And I literally fell backwards into culinary school. I like to cook and I like to entertain, but then I ended up at this total hippie school. That's where I started to learn Chinese medicine. That's where, you know, like you said, it's, you know, there's a circular view. It's like, there is an explanation for everything. And it was just like, oh my God, this, these aha moments just started to happen. And it was like, let me learn more. And it was just this sort of like, I had this voracious appetite for, you know, how does food interact with the body? What, what are they talking about? Mood and physicality are like sort of everything is connected. It's not mental health and physical health. And so I understand that, but I, you know, I always struggled with, well, I didn't get a degree, you know, I didn't go to, um, Chinese medicine school. I didn't, you know, it's just, I just had this appetite for it, but I'm like, you know, are people going to take me seriously? So I do understand that desire to have that sort of education to, you know, just that desire within yourself. You know, it's like, it's not for anybody else, but it is to sort of like substantiate, like, no, I am actually really smart. And so, you know, I oh, always, it was definitely for other people. There's that too. <laughs> I mean, that too. This is part of my burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And I'd love is to hear a little bit more need, about that story. Mm -hmm. Right, this need to prove myself to other people, to be good enough, to do enough, to be good enough, to be able to humble brag my way into people's respect. Oh, it's one of the things I talk to my clients about too. You know, when I have them list out what they like to do, what do they not necessarily like to do? What are they good at, but hate to do? And that one always trips people up. And I know you talk very similarly about those sorts of things because we're people pleasers, right? And so mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, your ability to sort of like, oh, look, I can do these wonderful things. And then we over index and then we end up burning ourselves out, which is where you come in. So I didn't mean to usurp the conversation, but, you know, I want to talk about I mean, I could talk about burnout all day long because I've been there too, but I want to hear yeah. about, you know, your story and how it led you, you know, to, to really focus on that niche because it is pervasive. Pervasive. And a lot of me talking about burnout now is owning up, being vulnerable and expressing those moments where I did make that choice for other people is, is be, just being honest about that because that's where burnout comes from. This, most of the time, there is an underlying feeling of not being valuable enough and needing to act in a certain way and accomplish certain things in order to prove value. But the thing is you never get there. And that's why we burn out because we're constantly trying to do things and we never judge them as good enough ourselves. So we just, instead of stopping and appreciating our accomplishments, we just push for the next goal and the next thing and the next check mark that we can, you know, kind of deal with. And so when I finished Chinese medicine school, all throughout Chinese medicine school, there was only one person younger than me in the school. So I started this program at a much earlier time than 80%, 90% of people that were going to school. I, the first week of school, people were like, oh, do you want to go out for a drink at the end of the week? And I was like, I'm not 21. And they were like, what? 
these were all 40 year old women. This mm-hmm. was all second career for most people. Yeah. So they were like, how did you end up here? And I was like, I've already been to China. I studied Eastern religion. Like I'm, you know, I do Qigong, like whatever. That's but, definitely ahead of your time for sure. Right. But talk about feeling inadequate. Yeah. Talk sure. about feeling inadequate. I finished school. When I finished school, I moved to Poland because I had taken a break. I took one semester off of school. I decided I needed to go to Argentina to learn Spanish. Meanwhile, I was living in San Diego, so like Spanish everywhere all the time. So, But I had this internal, like, I must go to Argentina and learn Spanish. And the first day I got there, I met my future husband. Wow. Yeah. So, and we've been together ever since. Okay. That, that's a whole separate story, but, I, but it, it, it's important right now because he's Polish. And when I finished school, we decided to start our lives together in Poland because his parents had bought him an apartment when he was in college. So we would be able to start something without having the burden of paying rent. And with my student loans, which didn't end up being a quarter of a million dollars, but did end up being, you know, almost $90,000, we needed some sort of financial break somewhere in order to, to start our lives. But I went to Poland not knowing if I was going to be able to work in my Uh field. And I got very lucky. And also, you know, I I did a, my podcast this week is about racism and, and it's intersectionality with, with burnout. And I realize now from today's perspective, that one of the reasons I was granted the position I was granted in an infertility center was because I look the way I do. Uh Right. So I went in as a woman who looks, you know, like most of the people in Poland, maybe I have freckles and that's not super common, but I have light eyes and light skin. And, and had I been someone else, I may not have gotten that opportunity. So I'd like to recognize that before we move forward, but I did get that opportunity and I became very successful as a fertility acupuncturist, the first one in the country. So this was very impressive, right? Uh Which was good for me because I was young and I needed to prove myself again. And I could tell people at home that, listen, like I'm, I was making good money. I was paying back my student loans faster than any of my counterparts. I opened my own private practice when I was 27. I had a three month waiting list. I was killing it, killing it, doing a job that I love in a medicine that I'm fascinated by. And I hated my life. I was tired. I was overrun. My boundaries were Polish people because of their history have a tendency um, to, there's a word in Polish, it's kombinować. And it does not mean to combine, even though it sounds very similar. It's this idea that when you can't get something done in the straightforward way, there's a way to sort of finagle otherwise. And they'll go through back doors and they'll use whatever way they can to get the thing that they want because that's how they had to function for a long time. Like if you got a ticket and you waited in line for four hours and you were given a pair of shoes that were size 10 and you're a size eight, you traded those size 10 shoes for a bag of flour from somebody who needed the shoe. Like you figured it out. Uh And so they still have that ability which is, which is a good ability for them, but I didn't know how to handle it. So they would call me and I'd say, I have a three month waiting list. And they'd say, well, you can fit me in during lunch. And I'd be like, wait, wait, no, no, I can't. And I said, no, when I held my boundary, but doing that was exhausting to me because I was getting one, two, three phone calls a day from people who wanted to see me now. And I, the, the, the desire for my help and the forcefulness behind it that they're accustomed to using to get their way I couldn't handle so I was in a foreign country I learned it took me two years but I speak fluent Polish now I so I learned the language fluently because that's also impressive isn't it is that's another thing that I can say look at look look at what I did right yes (laughs) It's it's yeah it's very impressive Right. So I did that. I moved to a foreign country. I learned a foreign language. I started infertility acupuncture in the country. I started a private practice. I killed, and then my thyroid broke down. Mm, I know that all too well. Yeah. 
right? My thyroid broke down and I didn't know that I was burnt out. What I thought at the time, I had done a lot of life coaching by that point. I had done an apprenticeship for a couple of years with one of Poland's best um, life coaches. So I had been learning to be a life coach and I had been doing the life coaching myself and I had been trying to fix myself until I got to the point where I realized that there was only so much I could do and that the soil of Poland just didn't suit me was too much for me, just did not match with the the, the vibes, just didn't match, which doesn't mean Poland is bad, but it is how I viewed it at the time. I was very blamey and very judgy about being there. And and I have to like take, I have to rewind a lot of things that I said over the years that were harmful and and not nice to the people in my community because I was like, it's Poland's fault, (laughs) you know, that I'm like, but I didn't know I was burnt out at the time. Yeah. And we all, I mean, I think that we all do that, especially when we're burnout is go into that, you know, blaming other people, you know, not necessarily looking inward. So it sounds, you know, you obviously have left Poland, you're in the U S now. So, you know, what, you know, you guys left and you know, now what, you know, now you're focused. We left and went to Prague. Oh, okay. We left. I told my husband, listen, we need to get out of here. He got a job offer within months of me saying this and we're, so we moved to Prague and Prague was much lighter. The whole, whole experience of Prague is lighter. The people are lighter. They're not positive. I wouldn't go that far, but they're not as heavy as the Poles. They, they kind of have more of a, like you do you, I'll do me and whatever. Nobody cares. And so that was easier for us. And I built another practice and I did so successfully and blah, blah, blah. And I was only working about 25 hours a week and I started to feel really tired again. I started to feel really overwhelmed again. I couldn't walk up the hill from the tram to my house and it was only a four minute walk. I had to stop halfway up because I was so tired. And it was at that time that I read the word burnout for the first time and I started reading through the research and I went, oh shit. (laughs) It me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, I, and then it just started. Then it just started unwinding. I started doing the work on myself. And, and you said before that, you know, I was putting stuff outside of myself. I was putting blame outside and I was. And at the same time, it's really important to realize that burnout is an internal and an external problem. Mm-hmm. There are some things that you can fix, right? But I could have, I did as much internal work as I was capable of in Poland, and it was not enough because the external environment did not suit me. So you can't change everything. And there's a, all this talk on, online about if you just change your mind and you fix your mindset and you do, no, I'm really sorry, but it's not enough. If your if your environment encourages burnout, there's only so much work you can do to change who you are. So if you're in a position in a job where you know it's not going to get any better, you have a micromanaging boss who is uh, you know covertly sexually harassing you, and you feel unsafe every day, and yeah, there's only so much internal work you can do. You can't combat that 100%. And people, there's a lot of, you know, you create your own reality and all of this, but there's 8 billion people on the planet and we're all creating this reality together. So no matter how much manifestation you do, you are still a part of the energetic soup that we're all living in together. Yeah. I, and I, you know, that's part of why I left my last nine to five is that it just, the external factors didn't, I wasn't aligned with who I truly was. You know, I wasn't living life in a way that was meaningful to me. And so, you know, it really was like, all right, what and how do I want to create my path? And so, you know, I, I I chose to leave. I chose to do this. I chose to, you know, help people. You know, I also, you know, work with people that are, you know, burnt out, but in a, in a different way, you know, it's go about it in a different way. And so, I mean, you had, we, and I think that that's why, you know, you're so good. Your story comes across. Your podcast is so engaging is because you lived through it, right? Like, and I think that that I lived through it. And so I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, And that was one of the reasons that, you know, your, you know, Instagram resonated with me. And then, you know, your podcast resonated with me because it's like, I was there too, you know, in my own way. And so what are you doing now, you know, in this, you know, you're not able to treat patients, I'm assuming, you know, you're not able to, so like, you know, how are you, you know, navigating this, you know, sort of new normal or this, I say it's more of a trans a transitional period. I don't, this is, you know, where we are kind of right now. I don't, it's not necessarily purgatory, but it is this, it's not, it's not going to be this way forever, but what are you doing to help yourself not be burnt out? 
So for me, helping myself not be burnt out is a constant thing, whether we're in the middle of coronavirus or not. Mm -hmm. because I do still have those tendencies, no matter how much work I've done, no matter how much trauma I've released, and no matter how much, there are still tendencies that I have had that are built into my brain that will take more time than three years to bust through mm -hmm. that mean that I naturally fall into, you know, it's time to prove myself. It's just something that I do very often, and I, ha that's, I have to keep my eye on that. So I have to pay attention to moments where I am acting in a way that is designed to um, impress other people instead of being in alignment with myself, right? So I have to meditate on a regular basis because otherwise you can't, you don't keep your energy in your own body if you're not making a concerted effort to keep your energy in your body. It's, mm -hmm. you, you have to make an effort for it. And the other thing that I think is super important that I feel like I'm the only person talking about is I look for places where I feel resentment. Mm -hmm. This is massively important because all of the places that I feel resentment are places where I am abandoning my own energy and inserting my energy in somebody else's problem, situation, need, want, desire, whatever it happens to be without, usually without their asking. And then I'm solving something for them without their asking. And then I'm annoyed that I've used all this energy and it's not appreciated, noticed, you know, blah, 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 whatever it happens to be. And so that resentment to me is like a massive, massive clue into where boundaries need to be placed in order to avoid burnout. So I pay attention to that resentment really closely because without it, I forget where my boundaries are supposed to be. And I don't mean external boundaries of saying no to people. I mean the internal boundary of not abandoning myself, not, not leaving my own body and, and energy behind to go into somebody else's stuff. Like you're going into the grocery store right now. You're not holding doors for anybody because you don't want to touch a door after someone. But normally somebody's like 10 steps too far for it to be totally natural for you to hold the door open for them and you do it anyway. And then they don't say thank you. Yeah. Those are the things that burn you out long-term, not your job to hold that door open unless yeah. you really, really want to. And if you really, really want to, the thank you doesn't matter. Exactly. I, I, it's, I think so well said and, you know, resentment I've heard, you know, resentiment, you know, look at it from a different angle. So I think that that's really important. What would you say, or what, you know, what advice would you give people or guidance? Would you give people, you know, what are sort of like three signs of burnout? Um, you know, that, Oh, I think I lost you there. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Nope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or, yeah. Sorry. My zoom is, funky. So whatever. We're, we're on the fly. We're yeah. here. We're fine. Yeah, we're here. We're fine. But what are some, you know, sort of telltale signs of burnout? Because I think a lot of people have them and don't necessarily, they just kind of go, Oh, it's, you know, whatever it, it, it is what it is. Um, and I think that there's a lot of physical symptoms that people dismiss. Um, you know, for me, like hair loss was, you know, I was like losing clumps of hair. I have a ton of hair anyway, but like it, I was losing clumps of it in the shower. Me too. And then it was just a, you know, naturopathic doctor, full blood panel. It's like your hormones are wacky. Your thyroid is wacky. Your selenium is low. Your ferritin is low. Your this is low. And I'm like, I, first of all, I've never even heard of the word ferritin, but anyway, in the interest <laughs> of time, like, you know, just what are some things that people can look at or, you know, sort of identify as these signs of burnout? that may not be the mental signs. I think the physical yeah. signs kind of resonate with people a little bit faster. Um, I would question that only because sometimes the physical things are, are very often ignored. That's what I mean, is that they're ignored as sort of like, eh, it's sort of whatever, but you know. Yeah, the and, and the, the thing about the physical signs that makes this really difficult and that I think makes it difficult for people to recognize their own burnout is any, any physical symptom that gets worse with stress is a burnout symptom, mm -hmm. which means every physical symptom yeah. is a burnout symptom because everything gets worse with stress. The, qu the problem is we don't recognize those things because we often, the stress that affects our body physically is the stress that we don't recognize emotionally. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. Mm -hmm. The stress that we feel physically is not the stress that we recognize emotionally. 
Mm -hmm. So most often when clients and patients talk to me about these things, they're saying, yeah, but I'm not stressed. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for people to recognize those symptoms no matter what they are, because it could be anything from IBS, from irritable bowel syndrome, to migraines, to mo almost everybody that I talk to has neck and shoulder tension. Every mm -hmm. single person that's burnt out, I have hundreds and hundreds of health intakes, and they all say neck and shoulder tension, mm -hmm. right? It's very common to have issues sleeping, which is it mental? Is it physical? A lot of times with burnout, you're exhausted all day long and then you lay down and your head starts cranking. We call this tired, but wired. Oh yeah. Adrenals. Your adrenals are not, not happy for sure. Right. So that's something, but it's really hard to talk about the physical symptoms because any type of pain, any type of pain anywhere in your body can be related to burnout. Any type of skin disorder, any type of digestive disorder, any type of sinus, cold, flu, immune disorder can be related to burnout. Burnout will make anything that was already happening in your life worse. Truth to that, <laughs> 100%. So I ask people to look at the emotional symptoms a lot because it's the things that they will, like resentment, once you start talking about it, people will start to recognize that. And resentment is a red a burnout red flag. If you're feeling resentful on a regular basis, if you start to pay attention to that, I have people do a resentment journal. And when they come up with 10 things that they're feeling resentment for, they're like, oh shit, right? That's massively important. The other thing is totally wiped out ability to handle things emotionally in a way that means that you are snapping, overreacting, and you know it. My patients often say, like, I feel like the crazy bitch in the house. And I know I'm being ridiculous and I can't help myself. When you feel like you cannot control your emotional reactions at all, there's burnout involved and trauma, but uh -huh. there's burnout involved, uh -huh. right? So those are really, really important things. But physically, I would say the biggest thing really physically above all else is exhaustion. And a lot of people, there's always advice to exercise no matter what's wrong with you. It's like exercise and you'll feel better. But when you're burnt out, like cardio is not your friend. You're going to, it's like you have an empty car battery and you're trying to jumpstart it, but the battery is like dead. So you'll jumpstart it for five minutes and you'll get down the street. But as soon as you turn the car off, it's going to die again. Yeah. That's what's happening. When you are feeling good and you exercise, you're recharging your batteries the same way a car does when it's running. Like that, that's, just, but if the battery's dead, the battery's dead. And when you're burnt out, the battery's dead. Like do not go for a run. Yeah. That's so, what I say, but, you know, it's like your phone battery. If it's down at 20%, yeah. you're frantically running around looking for a charger, but you don't recognize that your own body is at 20%. I was trying to do Bikram yoga when I was like completely fatigued and burnt out it was awful. Awful. It was awful. And we can talk about this literally forever, but I know you, <laughs> you have a book coming out. You have this program. Where can people find you? Quick blurb on that. You know, I think, you know, this is such an important topic and, you know, so many people are feeling this and not aware of it. You know, they're not aware that there is a place to turn, that there are resources. So I think the number one resource is the podcast, right? So mm -hmm. Fried the Burnout podcast, which you can find anywhere that you listen to podcasts um, and and following me on Instagram are the best ways to get all, because Instagram is the place that I share everything. I always answer my DMs. I'm on top of that. So Instagram is the best place to get me. And my handle is at Kate underscore Donovan. So and it's I'll as simple as, and that notes as, well. as simple as can be. But I think that's always the best way to find me because that's where you get the links to, I have a couple of DIY courses for people that are like massively on sale because of COVID until the end of April. So I have a couple of DIY classes on there that you can take. If you're not ready for one-on-one -on -one coaching, there's the link to book a one-on-one -on -one call with me to see if there's something that I can do for you long-term. I work with people over three three month periods as a, as a minimum. Um, because if you're really burnt out talking to me twice is it's just not going to do it. So, um, but all of those things, I think Instagram is the best place, the easiest and the best place to find me and, and where I have the most fun. Yeah, definitely. And that's where we connected. And it, it's, I learned something every time and her podcast is totally amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, literally we could talk for hours about burnout because, you know, who hasn't suffered burnout in their life? And it's just, it's crazy how it, 
takes over. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time um, and all of your wisdom. And you guys check her out on Instagram, check out the podcast. It is amazing. And we'll see you next time. If you have any questions, comments, comment below, follow Kate, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.